Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Thank you. Hello, hello. Thank you for coming. <coughs> so yeah, this is my new book, Mama Gone Geek. And uh, it's a little bit of a departure for me. I have written, I think, 48 books. But many of them are very obscure, like um, Indiana, the Hoosier State. That was a <laughs> one. Or One, Two, Three Green Frogs. So not all the books were as involved as this one. This one is a memoir of sorts. So it's a bunch of stories that come from my experience. Um, uh, and, and through the lens of science, how I kind of stayed, or I try to stay sane <laughs> as I'm parenting. So I'm going to do a couple things. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read a little bit of the introduction so you can um, get a sense of where I'm coming from in terms of my, my inner geekiness. And then, uh, and then I'm going to read you a story. So uh, I won't read the whole introduction, but I'll set the scene. Um, I learned that I was a geek when I was in the summer of fourth grade, and I went to uh, Camp Ketcha, which is right nearby where I grew up, and I fell in love with horses. Uh, I was the I just loved horses. I, I needed to learn everything about them. I learned the names of all of their bones and their muscles and anything that afflicted them and any anything. I just I couldn't get enough of horses. It's the only thing I talked to my counselor, the, the camp counselor, about was when is my horse lesson? When is my horse lesson? When is my horse? Lesson? I have a horse lesson today, and they're like, oh. Um, so at the end of the summer, uh, they always gave out awards. And oh gosh, you know, everybody dreamed of, you know, am I going to get the best all around camper? Am I going to get the best swimmer? Am I going to get best horseback rider? Uh, but I knew I wouldn't because Patty Barber was way better than me. But I was still hoping. I was still hoping. And um, uh, so that's the setting the scene here. This is the final day. The counselors gathered and handed out awards. We all had our hopes. Best all-around camper, best swimmer, funniest camper, most popular. I coveted the best horseback rider award, of course, but I knew in my heart that Patty or Amy, who were older and better, would win that. When my name was called, I stood up. The counselors were smiling. They bestowed upon me my award certificate. Most persistent camper. <laughs> What was that? What did that mean? There was no mention of horses or sports or popularity. Everybody clapped and all the adults laughed and cheered. Sally, the mean girl, turned to me and whispered, horse nerd. <laughs> I brought my award home and I showed my parents. They laughed, tears flowing from their eyes. What does it mean? What does it mean? What does it mean? What does it mean? Every time I asked, they just, they, they laughed harder. I looked it up on my own in the 50 pound dictionary in dad's study. Persistent, number one, refusing to give up or let go, persevering obstinately. Number two, insistently repetitive or continuous, a persistent ringing of the telephone. Number three, botany, lasting past maturity without falling off, as the calyx on an eggplant or the scales of a pine cone. Zoology, retained permanently rather than disappearing in an early stage of development, the persistent gills of fishes. For a while, I was embarrassed by this award. People had laughed at me. The word nerd seared into my self-confidence and made me shrink. Then the stubborn obstinacy that I had been awarded for kicked in. What's so bad, I wondered. I had no clue how it had anything to do with Camp Ketcha, but I kind of liked the part about not giving up. If being persistent meant to love something enough to want to learn everything about it, then bring it on. What I did not yet know was that being most persistent camper followed being passionate and was the foundation of curiosity, knowledge, and discovery. My persistence was a symptom of my exploration of passion and science. So that's how it kind of all started. Um, and then I, I'm going to advance here. So not a day goes by that my kids aren't engaged in a why, what, if, or I wonder. It sharpens their sense of amazement and accessibility of knowledge while creating a broader view of themselves and the world. To help encourage this sort of curiosity and wonder, I've included some of my favorite activities, projects, and experiments at the end of each chapter, because I think they're fun, and I think they also work as a wonderful springboard into conversations that go even deeper. You know, it's a little geeky. So at the end of every essay, I have a little experiment that you can do. 
geekiness is a treasure. It's a legacy that I love sharing, and one I hope Kai and Leo, those are my kids, will pass along to their children someday. Science isn't just for geeks, it's the future. If you're a parent or planning to become one, it's your future. And that's true, that's sort of my soapbox. I, I think, you know, everybody should be exposed to science. It, it's fun, it doesn't have to be agonizing. I don't know about you, but for me, when I was in third or fourth grade, science was agonizing. We had these, oh God, we had these horrible kits that were made up of corks and pebbles. And it was like, what floats, what doesn't? And you're like, <laughs> not a challenge. <laughs> the pebble doesn't float. Um, so I kind of, I have this, I have this thing that you sh science should be accessible to kids and you should be able to do these cool science experiments with stuff that you already have around the house, not something you have to go or a chemical you can't pronounce. So that's sort of my, that's sort of my soapbox. All right, so the chapter I'm going to read to you is called, I hate to tell you, but you're a little bit fat. <clears throat> Did you know that a person who weighs 120 pounds on Earth would weigh just eight pounds on Pluto? Not that I've seen 120 pounds since I was in like seventh grade, but it's nice to know it's just a number and that the mass of me is a variable. There's a comfort in that, the kind of comfort I clung to when we packed for Hawaii. Isn't it so boring to hear moms complain about their soft figures since they had the baby? It is, but I'm no exception. I complain, I worry about it, I joke about it to deflect the niggling worry that I'm no longer an attractive young thing. I'm now married and saddled with a ring of blubber around the middle that, like a life preserver, just won't quit. I know, I know, in my head, I am good, I own my body. It has taken me years of fending off obsession and diets and slimming jeans and shapewear and vertical stripes and slimming shades of color. I swim, I walk, I'm strong, I'm still working on the self-image stuff. So when Kai was three and a half and Leo was one and a half and we were packing for Hawaii, I had to face the idea that I would be mostly nude in public. Lycra does not a cover-up make. The pools, the great bodies of water that were my friends during pregnancy were now staring me in the face. I worried. But it was Hawaii, after all, paradise. Plenty of real bodies from poi eaters to Midwest corn-fed mamas. I was not unique. I had emerged from the hotel, pale-skinned shark bait, as Keith called me, in my new suit that I hoped was slimming. I felt faux confident as I walked across the pool deck in the early morning warmth. I had an iced coffee under my belt and I was feeling good. The pool was sparsely attended at that hour of the morning. I decided to take the leap, both metaphorically and literally. To hell with this body insecurity, it's ridiculous. I passed the waterfalls, the koi pond, the large main pool, and the grotto hot tubs, and made my way to the small pool off the beach side of the pool complex where Keith and the boys were splashing in the shallows. I didn't skip a beat. I dropped my towel, sprinted up the stairs, and leapt into the water slide. It was exhilarating. I zipped, dropped, turned, and finally shot out like a buttered ham and a cannon and landed the splash. I rose to the surface laughing and floated over to Kai. He was laughing and smiling at me. He reached for me as he scrambled to get close. This boy was so sweet, love in his eyes. Here we were in paradise. Mommy? Yes, love. I reached over and cupped his freckled cheek. I hate to tell you, but you're a little bit fat. <laughs> How can a single sentence undo a woman's confidence so thoroughly? I immediately start sobbing. It wasn't my finest moment. Kai's face crumpled and he looked at me in shock and he started to sob. Keith thought we were drowning, so he lunged in both to try to drag us out. This made me cry harder and sent Kai into hysterics. Leo, who was in Keith's arm, was startled, so he began to sob too. What's wrong? What's wrong? What's wrong? Keith erupted in rapid succession. This made us all cry even more. It was ugly. I handed Kai off to Keith and hauled myself from the pool. He stood there confused, a sobbing boy under each arm. I wrapped the towel around myself and folded into a chaise just in time for the waitress, who was wearing a bikini, to come by and ask me if she could get me a drink. It was 6.30 in the morning. <laughs> Pina colada, please, I mustered. Of course, she said with a wide island smile. She walked off and I found myself again. Wait a minute, wait a minute. When did I get pathetic? I hailed her. She turned. Can you make that an iced tea, please? She smiled. Of course. I dropped my towel and hopped into the pool. I wrapped my arms around my sobbing boys. I picked up Kai and looked him in the eye. Mommy, I'm sorry, he sobbed. Sweetie, you just surprised me, that's all. I know I may seem a little bit fat, and yes, it's interesting how a woman's body responds to getting older. 
I really had no idea where I was going. I wanted to let him know that fat isn't anything to be ashamed of. I wanted to arm him with all the things with which I really wanted to arm myself. Tell me what happened. Keith was calmer now. I came out of the slide and Kai said, I hate to tell you, but you're a little bit fat and I lost my cool. Oh, sweetie, that's a line from the movie we watched this morning at four o'clock when they got up because of jet lag. A bug said it to a caterpillar. Kai thought it was funny. He's been saying it ever since. You should have seen the bikini waitress's response. Did you see her? She's not fat. I looked at Keith and we both broke out into hysterics. Then I looked at Kai. In the movie, it was funny, mommy. I don't think you're fat. I think you're beautiful. Kai launched at me, wrapping his small body around me, clinging and sobbing again. Oh, baby, I didn't know it was a line from a movie. I did wonder why you delivered it in a German accent, though. <laughs> you are funny. You are. I just misunderstood. I was only thinking from my perspective, and I was feeling a little vulnerable. The great thing is you brought it to my attention that I was worried about something that I should not spend time worrying about, right? Huh? Well, if I'm worried that I need to make my body more fit, then I shouldn't cry about it. I should just do something about it. You helped me see that. I did? Yep. Hey, Mom, he said, and pushed off in the pool. Watch me swim. He swam out four strokes and then back. Well done. Watch me float. I floated, belly up. Wow. How did you do that? Well, honey, believe it or not, I'm an awesome floater because I'm a little bit fat. <laughs> he looked at me wide-eyed. It looked like it could fall on either side of my joke. Thankfully, we both laughed. Daddy floats, too. Yep. Really well. Yeah. Happily, yes. Hey, Keith said and splashed us. Dive in. That's what this was telling me. What else floats? Kai climbed out of the pool and amassed a few objects. A quarter, a container of sunscreen, goggles, a coffee cup. One by one, he dropped things into the pool and exclaimed every time something sank or floated. If it floated, he bellowed, it's a little bit fat. <laughs> this was the mantra of the whole trip. Delight expressed if something floated. Joy when something was a little bit fat. It was a good lesson for me to learn. After a poolside lunch of sushi, I had an idea. I took my water bottle and a packet of soy sauce and brought it back to the pool. We filled up the bottle with the pool water and dropped in the soy sauce packet. It floated. We capped the bottle and then squeezed. The packet sunk. We let it go. It floated. It's a little fat and then not, Kai exclaimed. His eyes lit up. Like you, mommy. You are right about that, honey. But how does it work? It's all about density. Truer words have never been uttered. What? Well, the soy sauce itself would sink in the water, but it's in a packet, and it has a little pocket of air that holds it up. See? Oh, I see it. It's like a little balloon that makes it float. Exactly. When you squeeze the bottle, you squeeze the soy sauce packet, and you make the air bubble smaller, and it just can't hold the packet up anymore. Because of pressure? This metaphor was biting me right in the blubbery butt. Yup, under that kind of pressure, it will sink. Hmm. Kai trotted off and hopped into the pool with his bottle. He squeezed that thing and let it go all day. Up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down. He explained to anyone who walked by all trip. Yes, there was a part of me that was dazzled by the fact that my boy was geeking out over a physics experiment, but every time I saw Kai's delighted surprise and amazement at the ups and downs, I reminded myself that once again, my salvation was in science. It's all about floating and sinking, isn't it? We put pressure on ourselves, and the little bubble that holds us up is overwhelmed, and we sink. Let go a little, and we rise back up to the top. We're so used to being programmed to believe and, what, and be what we are told. Be skinny, be fit, always smile, have perfect hair in all the right places, not the wrong ones. Life isn't always that easy. We all have moments when we sink and moments when we float. Moments when we're a little bit fat and moments when we just believe we are. I guess the trick is to be clear-eyed and just enjoy the constant dance between the floating and the sinking. So, this is the bottle. <laughs> I got a soy sauce packet in here, and it floats, right? But look, if you squeeze it, it sinks. It's just like life. <laughs> So that's a little taste of what my book is all about, and I am here to answer any questions if anybody has any. No? No questions? <laughs> anything, anything from online? Not yet. All right. Should I read another one? I'll read a short one. Shall I read a short one? Yeah. All right. I was going to read you the one about head lice. 
but I think I might give you the one where, uh, let's see. There's so many fun ones. There's the time Kai swallowed a magnet. <laughs> so science has really been my go-to friend with all the questions. You know, inevitably you get the question, you know, where do babies come from? And oh, it took me by surprise. Kai was in the back seat, and I'm like, now? This is happening now? You know, where's Keith? Why am I, what? So I just jumped right in and talked about DNA. Um, uh, how old are your kids now? My kids are 12 and 10 now. Kai is now 12 and Leo is 10. And, uh, and they like, they, they're still okay with this. <laughs> they're like, go ahead, read the story. I don't think I can write them now. I don't think I, somebody has said, your next book should be about puberty. And I'm like, oh my God, my kids would never talk to me. <laughs> um, I'm going to read. Sorry. All right, I'm going to read Lice because... Why not? <laughs> it was a lovely early morning in the Pacific Northwest. Foggy, warming, spring was a promise in the air. Parents gathered at the bus stop with mugs in hand and kids scrambling up trees. The birds were singing, bugs were buzzing, and the people were full of good cheer. The bus dragged its caterpillar-like body up the main drag and hissed to a halt in front of us. The buses on Bainbridge are retro. Of course they are. They're picturesque, like enormous Twinkies on wheels. The kids jogged across the street, backpacks whacking their backsides in unison with each footfall. We sipped our coffee, smiled warmly, controlled our well-behaved dogs on their leashes, and waved to our perfect children. A mom sidled up next to me and whispered conspiratorially, Hey, I just wanted you to know that there might be, although only possibly perhaps, be a small, no big deal outbreak of lice at school, specifically in Leo's class, but you didn't hear it from me. I waved to Leo, and he waved back from the window on the Twinkie bus, as if on cue he started scratching his head. <laughs> the other moms took a gentle and friendly step back. They had been listening. Everybody listens when somebody whispers. My head started to itch, too, but I was determined not to succumb. To succumb. Lies, I said with a nervous giggle. I didn't hear anything from school. Oh, they're everywhere. They can't get them out of the carpet in the kindergarten room. And when the kids go into cozy reading corner and put their little noggins together, the lice have a field day. It's a big problem in Leo's class. I know for sure there was a girl on the playground with the little things just hopping off her head. Her mom is one of those all-natural types and doesn't believe in killing the lice with anything harsher than mayonnaise. But you didn't hear it from me. Mayo? One mom said, seriously? Well, we've never had it, said another. Oh, no, neither have we. But I hear it's a problem, and really, there's no shame in it. It's not a reflection of how clean or dirty you are, from what I hear. The conversation bubbled around me. Lies, even worse. Secret lies. Woo. Even worse than that, I did what any self-respecting Bainbridge Island mom would do when faced with the possibility of a nasty parasite infection. As the back of my head seared with a tingle, calling me to drag my fingernails across my itching scalp, I ignored the itch and deftly denied the possibility of lice. Not my family. Yuck. The thing is, as soon as she said it, I knew we had it. Lice had simply not been on my radar, ever. Leo had been scratching for a week, and so had I. I thought my shampoo was too drying, or that maybe the laundry detergent was irritating the back of my neck. All good and very clean reasons for scratching your hand. But lice? Ew. Visions of medieval paupers, street people, and Dickensian waves with no loving homes wafted through my tingling head. Panic began to simmer. I could go home and soak everything in insecticide, or I could lean on my old friend science and see what I could dig up. First, I looked up lice. There are a zillion sites dedicated to the identification and removal of head lice. Some have cute names like lice to know ya, hair whisperers, Miami lice, <laughs> Rapunzel secret, or nitwit. I went directly to the centers of disease control. Pediculus humanus capitis, the head louse, is an insect of the order Socodia, and is an ectoparasite whose only hosts are human the louse feeds on blood several times daily and resides close to the scalp to maintain its body temperature. They're bugs. They're parasites, which means they live on a host and cause it harm. Okay, I thought, nothing new. Lice are about the size of a sesame seed. That almost makes them sound cute. Sesame seeds are kind of cute. 
but look closer. They're milky beige. Lots of ugly things are milky beige. Lice have six grasping legs with a single sharp claw at the end of every appendage. This helps them grasp the hair shaft and grasp they do. They have a swollen, segmented abdomens. Females cement their eggs onto the shaft of hair near the scalp. Their eggs need the warmth of the human scalp in order to incubate and develop. They are tiny white spots called nits. Again, that sounds cute, doesn't it? They can hang out on the hair for about a week before hatching into nymphs, adolescent lice. I can only imagine the attitude of adolescent lice. <laughs> One of the signs that you might have head lice, according to the CDC, is the feeling that someone, something tiny is scampering around on your skull. The nymphs are scampering. Again, it sounds cute, but it's not. Nymphs just look, like, look just like adult head lice, but they're about the size of the head of a pin. Because they're insects, their skeletons are on the outside, and they have to molt and shed their skin before they can grow. So they do this three times in one week, and at the end of, emerge as an adult. Ew. And then there's the itch. A louse's tiny, sharp mouth parts slice into your scalp, suck the blood right out of you. That's what itch is. Their slimy saliva is filled with an anticoagulant so your blood will flow. They need to have a blood meal several times a day. They can live for 30 days on your scalp before kicking it. The females can lay up to eight nits a day. So in a month, one louse could make your head pretty crowded with 240 possibly viable nits waiting to hatch, and then they lay more nits. And that's just one. They all grow up and lay more eggs. The math is staggering. If an adult louse wanders off the host's head, I think it's funny to call your head a host. It's not like you're throwing a party. It crawls because it cannot jump. It can creep to a scarf or a hat or a pillow, but unless it finds a new scalp to explore, it will die within a couple of days. See how my head... <laughs> I read about how lice are drawn to the cleanest of heads. They're passed around when kids exchange hats or put their heads together, or, as in Leo's case, when they roll around on infested carpets in the book nook or the cuddle corner. Lice are just doing their job, making a living, having kids, trying to survive. Unfortunately, they do it on our heads, and only our heads. For some reason, they don't hang out on dogs or cats or even other parts of our own bodies, though I was horrified to read that sometimes they can lay their eggs on your eyelashes and eyebrows. They like good, clean, warm places to live. Really, they're just like any living thing, except they're gross, and they carry with them a nasty stigma. What parents want their kids to be the lice kid? Was Leo the lice kid? Did that make us the lice family? Did that make me the lice mama? <laughs> the horror. I emailed Mrs. Barrel and asked if she'd seen any itching or signs of, that Leo had lice. Could he go to the nurse and be checked? She wrote back that she was instructed to tell me that unless he has actual lice on his head or was complaining, he could stay in school. What? That wasn't my question. No wonder they had a problem. She also said they were not allowed to send kids home or even send out a message, apparently an effort to spare parents the humiliation of having their kids pinned with an unpleasant label. When the boys got home from school, I channeled my inner monkey and went through their hair in search of the elusive lice, and they're apparently easier to spot nits. But I could see no nits. But I still knew something was up, so we went to the doctor. Actually, we were going that day anyway, so when Dr. England was just about to to have Leo say, ah, I said casually, he may have lice. How can we tell? Dr. England recoiled. You recoiled. Did I? He asked sheepishly and laughed. You're a doctor, and you have kids, and you recoiled. <laughs> I said, trying to laugh my way through the moment. They're icky. Well, yeah, that's true. I have lice, Leo interrupted. Cool. I want to <laughs> name them. Well, let's take a look, said the doctor. He snapped his hand into the rubber glove and took a pencil and a light and gently lifted a section of Leo's hair. He looked. Suddenly he winced and recoiled again, this time dropping the pencil. <laughs> He's got it. He, and then he made an ew face. Leo, however, had an elated face. He was psyched. Awesome! He spouted and began spitting out possible lice name. Pygmy Scout, Itchy Scratchy Digger, Chomp, Little Bit. Meanwhile, I was thinking, if you were a doctor, are you ever supposed to make an ew face? <laughs> Especially when all the websites I saw and the parents at the bus stop that morning assured me that there was no shame in head lice. If there was no shame, then why was our doctor so desperate to get us out of his office? Why the wince? I pretended I did not notice this time. You're going to want to shampoo everything with that nasty lice shampoo and then pretty much wash everything in the house, he said. Then he looked at Leo and Kai. Don't share hats with anyone. Put your jackets over the back of your chair at school. And then he looked at me. Been to the movies lately? Why, is there a lice monster versus Tokyo flick I shouldn't miss? He did not laugh. Instead, he grimaced. 
You can get it at the movies because people hunker down and put their heads on the upholsters back, upholstered back of the chairs. You come along and lay back and woomph, you got lice. Woomph? Yeah, nasty, huh? Okay, so have a good weekend and let me know if you have any questions. As we left the doctor's office, en route for the cleaning of a lifetime, my head spun. How many surfaces do our heads actually contact in a day? The car seat, the pillows, the couches, the hats, the scarves, the collars, towels, blankets, sheets, stuffed animals, animals. I was feeling the power of organization and plan of attack coming on. Bring it on, Lice, I will take you down. Kai interrupted quietly from the back. Mom, don't tell anyone, okay? We had lice, but in a world where this kind of thing doesn't happen out loud, the outbreak was to be kept secret. There was something deeper happening here. Oh, honey, I said, you didn't do anything wrong. I know I didn't, but I don't want everyone knowing that we have bugs on us. It's gross. What would they think of me? They'll think you're a bug garden, a bug arena, a bug ecosystem, piped up Leo. It's science, he said, as if he were announcing a monster truck rally star. Well, honey, here's the thing I started in. Oh, here we go. I could hear his eyes roll. I think we got lice for a reason. Because we're gross? No, not exactly. I think we got it because other people are ashamed of it. So they didn't say anything and we caught it from them because they had no, we had no warning. They're ashamed of the idea of lice because it carries a bunch of bad ideas with it. What? If you are embarrassed about something because you think it makes it you unworthy or unlikable, you hide it. You make it a secret. You push it under the rug. You get lice from under the rug? Well, kind of. The fact that no one said anything made us vulnerable in a way that because we had no reason to protect ourselves against something, we had no idea that was lurking out there. But how come we got it? How come we're the ones? It's not fair. Lice isn't fair, get it? Ha, life isn't fair, life's lies. Yeah. Kai was silent and about to tear up in the back. Why do these things always happen in the car? I parked. Are you crying? Asked Leo incredulously. No. I reached back to hold his hand. Listen, love, here's a cool opportunity for us to be courageous and maybe even make a difference for somebody else. If we tell people we have it, then they can plan. We didn't create the lice. Yeah, that's eggs, said Leo. Or is it mama lice? Hey, which came first, the lice or the lice egg? He waggled his eyebrows. We didn't start the lice outbreak, but we could help stop it maybe. How? Well, we take of our, care of our problem first. I paused just to scratch my head. We shampoo, we comb, we clean, we stick everything that fits into the dryer, and then we seal everything else in plastic. We'll take these lice down. Downtown, said Leo. Sup, lice, you're going down. Kai cracked a sideways smile and glanced at Leo. Sup, lice, really? Then we tell folks, I continued, we don't keep the stupid secret that there are lice. We destroy the power of the secret. We we destroy the power of the secret shame of lies. Are you with me? Yes, hollered Leo. I guess, said Kai, a little less enthusiastically. We drove home, despite the myriad natural treatments, from mayonnaise to oils, unguents, and various citrus rind I had been reading about all morning. We took the triple threat approach. The phone rang. Hi, Lynn, it's Bev. You have lice? How awful for you. Can I drop off a casserole? I thought she was kidding, but she wasn't. I knew her kid probably had it as well. Everybody had it. She was never going to admit it. She was reveling in our misery. It's way better to watch someone squirm than to be the one squirming. Oh, God, what have I set up for my kids? Lice. It was now defining us. Even the doctor winced. The phone didn't stop ringing. The moms at the bus stop riddled me with questions. Emails flooded in. Everyone wanted to know how I faced the demon lice and lived. Parents that didn't even know stopped me in the grocery store. Lice mom, you're the lice mom, right? Lice mom, like a superhero or an action figure. Lice Barbie, her arms bend so she can reach her itchy scalp. <laughs> can you look at my daughter's hair? She's been scratching. Show the nice lice lady, honey. People at the gym stopped me. Hey, you have lice, right? I heard. Can you tell me if this is dandruff or if this is lice? I heard myself spouting off comments like, actually, more kids get head lice than all the other communicable diseases all added up, you know, except for colds. People would nod from a safe distance. But I sensed that they were grateful for the information. Somehow in my zeal to teach my kids how to take the high road and take responsibility, I became the town lice expert. Even though I postured to the kids that we had done the right thing, deep down I was embarrassed. I was horrified and I felt judged. The drama all happened on the parental front. We can be so judgmental when in fact it's the virus or the bacteria or the louse just doing what organisms do, making their way, replicating, and finding the best way to survive, just like us. The kids were fine. 
Leo never once thought any part of the whole life saga wasn't awesome. He loves insects, and he delighted in the science of their life cycle. He learned about parasites and communicable diseases. It was a great springboard for him. I decided to embrace Leo's thrill of the revolting and take it all in, the, in its disgustingnesses. We're not perfect, though we spend so much of our time trying to make ourselves seem so. We do this to ourselves by dieting and training for triathlons and spending obscene amounts on clothing or by sucking the fat of our butts and injecting it into our face or by not allowing ourselves to delight in pasta, chocolate, or any other decadent pleasure for fear of adding pounds. We work to have the perfect kind of house and furniture and yard and car and job and relationship and kids. Can I possibly even consider myself a decent parent if we all got lice? Hell yes. The nerd gift that life brought to me was the realization that my job as a parent was not to tell my kids that they were perfect. I am not perfect. Keith is not perfect. Life is not perfect. Perfection is too much pressure, and it's all about secrets and show. My job is to tell myself and my kids, you are imperfect, and that's what makes you beautiful. You hold that itchy head up high. You are authentic. You are real. You have lice. Admit it. Embrace it. And zap those suckers. Is your head itching yet? <laughs> and then the, the uh, experiment at the end of that is to make this cool jam jar terrarium and you can catch bugs and put them in there and see their life cycle and all that stuff and it's a fun springboard for, for that kind of thing so that's it yes online question okay. um, what tactics or strategies have you used to keep kids interest in science both at home and in school when a kid such as mine his name is uh, <laughs> Julian um, is often bored in school and school science lessons. Well, I would, oh, yeah, I can understand. I can relate. Um, I would find out what Julian, is Julian the boy's name? Julian is the dad. Oh, the dad. Find out what the kid loves. You know, my kid loves soccer and gymnastics, and so we do a lot of that as a springboard for physics or uh, bouncing. You know, they're big on bouncing on the trampoline. There's all sorts of fun things you can do to talk about science and to, to put it in, even though it's a game. And, um, or, you know, if it's music, that's another thing. Anything, any, any interest that he has can be brought, can be looked at through the science, uh, through the lens of science. And I think that's it. Bring, bring the kid's own passion to it and then find out where those, where those take you. That's, that would be my advice. Because science is fun and it's everywhere. It's in everything. And that's, we just need, you know, to, to raise science literate kids, we need to inject them with that knowledge that joy of discovery that sort of that science is really the basis of everything out there and that it's sort of almost bottomless there's more and more and more and more and the more you wonder uh the, the more magical it is and 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 yeah and the more you look and the more i don't know at that i'm sorry i go off <laughs> find out what he's passionate about and find a way to, to bring science to it be yeah. Yeah. So I have a question. So I myself am not very sciencey. I think the last science class I took was when I was in high school. <laughs> so how do we bring ourselves up to the science level where we can explain to kids and whatever when I don't know myself? Right. Well, and so that's the thing. I mean, there's examples in here when my kids ask me a question and I don't know the answer. Like we were camping and they were obsessed with the fire, you know, and they like, uh, what's fire? And of course, Keith just says, ask your mother. And I'm like, oh, you know, I can tell you that it's a chemical react. I mean, it's a reaction between molecules. I can tell you that, but I don't know what it is. Like, I didn't know how to explain it. So we actually took that, and that was our springboard. We looked together. Now, I lost them in the first five minutes, but I was fascinated. And then after I learned, I could sort of turn it into something else, which was, do you know what? OK, you know, let's burn a marshmallow. Let's look at that, you know, and, and, and bring it back to what's interesting to them. But um, yeah, I don't claim to be an expert at all. I'm just fascinated with science. And so I think everybody's in the same boat. And, and really, what we're teaching them is to ask those questions, to wonder out loud, and then to find ways to, to, solve, to solve the answers. Yeah? Um, as a follow-up to that, so how old are, were your kids when you started introducing them to this kind of conversation? Baby, baby, babies. Uh, you know, uh, not necessarily the conversation, but but everything was always like, hey, this is cool, and look, you know, and I mean, if they were two, we would do this and squeeze it and just say, I mean, they don't want to know about, they're not going to understand about density, but they, but it's cool if you squeeze it and it drops and, you know. Um, yeah, and, and as soon as they were walking, I mean, and there's all sorts of stuff. There's stuff you can do in the bathtub, you know, and again, it's not even asking them to understand the science principle behind it yet, but it's just that wonder, like, blowing a bubble is magnificent, you know? And then later on, 
it's even more magnificent when you realize it has to do with air pressure and surface tension. That's cool. But, you know, when they're really little, it's the bubble. <laughs> sort of a follow-up to that is how do you know how much to give them? Like, how much depth? Or, or do yeah. they just... When they lose? start to glaze, which is what my kids do all the time. They're like, oh, she's still talking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just push it until they kind of... <laughs> <laughs> yeah? Um, with the holidays coming, uh, grandparents are asking, oh, what should we get them? And I'd much rather have something he can learn from uh -huh. rather than something that has a million pieces that yeah. get lost or yeah. vacuum. Um, can you recommend either a retailer or a brand or something that has science involved that you've seen is great for young kids, like kids under, under the age of seven maybe, something that they can get introduced to? Yeah, well, I'm going to do a little self-pitch here. I did a book called Pop Bottle Science, and it's a book that comes in a bottle, and it's 79 science experiments you can do with a plastic soda pop bottle. Because these things are cool. They're like little mini science labs. And uh, you can do it in the bottle that the book comes in, or you can use other pop bottles. And it's great because, again, they're springboards for things. So some of the science kits out there look so great and then you open them up and they're like oh my god a baggie of baking soda that's it you know like I have that at home so that's why I don't like the kits as much because I think um, it's more fun to kind of say you've got this stuff you've got these cool chemicals in your in in the kitchen let's go and see what we got um, so uh, I haven't found, you know, aside from pop bottle science, um, uh, necessarily, uh, the kits just seem all more flash to me than, than solid science. Um, but having said that, there are some really cool ones out there. I think uh, um, Steve Spangler is wonderful. Uh, and I don't think he sells, I don't know whether he sells through Amazon. He might only sell through his website. He's a science educator. He educates science teachers. Um, and he's... He, a lot of his uh, experiments do have the special chemicals, but not all of them, and it's worth looking at. And uh, there's um, and some of these experiments you need to have a grown-up with, um, but they're pretty pretty great. I think um, I can't even remember the names of the of the of the titles of the book, but Steve Spangler is his name, and he's he's great. Yeah. yeah. I was curious about how you come up with your projects. I mean. For instance, just what you have up there. I mean, are you? Do you come up with a because question a and think, huh? How can I prove this concept? Or, yeah. Like, what is your? Yeah, or it's a lot of it is. Um, my kids are visual. Both of them are really visual, and um, I. When I first started teaching, it actually goes back to them. So my first teaching job way back in the day is when they would take kids that had behavior problems and they would take them out of the mainstream classrooms and put them all in one classroom. And it was the behavior problem classroom. And that was my first job. So I had 25 behavior problem kids and, and me, you know. And um, it was remarkable. These kids were amazing. They weren't, there was a couple that were scary. Ugh! I don't even know what happened to them. But most of them were fantastic. Most of them just learned really differently. One kid was a visual learner and um, they said to me, he, he cannot do a sequence. He can't hear a story and then tell you what happened at the beginning and the middle and the end. He cannot do sequencing. This is a huge problem. But he was so bright. I didn't buy that. I didn't buy that he couldn't do it. And so um, I noticed that he was drawing. He was in fourth grade. He was drawing. And so I thought, ah, we're doing these Japanese myths. So I made a film strip. This is really dating myself. Do you remember film strips? <laughs> so I made a film strip of what happened in this tale of Urashima Taro. And then afterwards, I said, draw me a picture of, of what happened at the beginning of the story. Boom, he whipped off this amazing picture. Draw me a picture about the middle. And he drew me a picture, and he drew me a picture at the end. And then I said, OK, can you give me a sentence of what's going on in this picture? And he did. It's like he could sequence. He just couldn't get to it just verbally. He had to get through it visually first. So that was such a huge, and, and there was a girl who was musical. And she was, <laughs> she was in sixth grade. They were, it was fourth through eighth grade, too, by the way. This was a pretty big span. It was a, it was a really eye-opening job. Um, and she couldn't get, they were, we were there, she was studying the excretory system. And she just was, you know, she couldn't get it. She couldn't get it. kidneys and the ureters and the urethra. And she couldn't get the ureters from the urethra. And so I was like, OK, but she, she loved music. So I was like, OK, urethra, there's one urethra because there's only one Aretha Franklin. And she's like, oh. And so we, we sang a song about the, you know, the tubes. And, um, and then she got her test back. And, uh, and she had to label the parts. And she wrote. Uh, Urethra Franklin, <laughs> which is <laughs> great. <laughs> but it was a way to get in. And that's, um, that's what all of this is. It's just a way to get, it's a way to get that, to access 
the wonder of things, right? And so with my kids, you know, they're physical. They want to build stuff. They want to, you know, they want to squeeze things. So, uh, you know, oftentimes, even if I'm going to have a conversation with them, we'll make slime and they'll play. You know, that used to bug me at first. I'm like, stop, put that down. But then I realized after I, I, it, I was learning about language and how boys process language differently than girls, um, that this actually helped them. Like doing something with, with slime, something physical actually helped them be able to verbally process. It, it, it's all interesting. So yeah, so they come, they come up with what's around me. How can I show this? You know, and, um, and that's what a lot of this is about too. There was one where Leo cut his hand. <laughs> Leo hates needles and things like that. He was five, I think. He cut his hand and uh, we had to go and get stitches and he was beside himself and I'm like no it'll be interesting it'll be so cool and the body heals itself and he was buying none of it and uh, they put numbing stuff on him and he couldn't even feel it but he was just he was freaking out we had I had him on my lap they had five people one holding an appendage right <laughs> and he's screaming and what they have earplugs <laughs> No, I've got that kid, and he's screaming, and he's like, ah! and he looks at the doctor, and he goes, I hate this planet. <laughs> like, wow, go big or go home. And uh, the thing is, it's because he couldn't not look at it. He couldn't not. The idea of her putting a needle into his skin, like, oh my god! So I was like, oh god, there's tongue depressors. So I made this little thing with tape, and it was a like a little dragonfly, and and I, and I taped some pennies on it. I'm like, look, it's center of gravity. Look, hold your finger out. Let's see if we can balance it. And so I was doing that over here, and while he was trying to balance it, she sewed him up, you know. And then he's like, no. <laughs> she's like, do you still hate the planet? He's like, no. <laughs> but yeah, so it's what you know, finding stuff, and and that's something that nobody needs to have, you know, nobody needs to know about the string theory to do that. It's just more of a creative, you know, like what do I have around me? And that was a simple distraction thing. So, well, Lynn, thank you so much for thank coming. You. Thank you.